One would have thought that a cave with a biblical connection would be harmless. Unfortunately, it isn't. Wayne Russell was diving with his friends in Jacob's well, and after a while, he signaled that it was time to go, with Wayne coming behind. On their way up, Wayne was nowhere to be found. Running low on air, they have to come up with a solution. Despite its inviting appearance, the crystal clear water in Jacob's well is quite dangerous. According to historical accounts, settlers came across the watering hole around 1850. It measures 12 feet in diameter and was spouting water up to 5 feet high when it was first discovered. The settlers didn't dive into the well, but rather used it as a source of drinking water and even harnessed its power to operate a sawmill. The settlers named it Jacob's Well, inspired by its biblical grandeur. The temperature of the water stays constant year-round at 20 degrees Celsius. And since its discovery, explorers have explored at least 4,500 feet of the well. It is now considered to be the second largest fully submerged cave in Texas, with an average depth of 120 feet and situated on 80 acres of protected land. Jacob's Well receives its water from the Trinity Aquifer, which covers most of the southwestern region of the state. However, the fountain no longer discharges water at the rate of 170 gallons per second due to the development in the area and now only produces a slight ripple on the surface of the water. The water flows into Cypress Creek. Exploring Jacob's Well by diving can be risky as the passages are narrow, which necessitates removing the tanks. Even at the surface, Jacob's Well can be dangerous, as it is surrounded by rocks, and some people dive headfirst into it, performing flips and so on. Wayne Russell, who started caving at the age of 15 in 1962, later joined the National Speleological Society. He dedicated himself to caving extensively in California, Texas, and Mexico, where he explored and mapped various water caves. Despite being a member of the NSS cave diving section, he did not receive certification as a cave diver. When he wasn't exploring caves, Wayne worked as a mail carrier in Austin, Texas. His primary focus during his caving expeditions was mapping and cave photography. Furthermore, he played an active role in the speleological community, serving as vice chairman and chairman of the Texas Speleological Association during the 1970s. Over the years, he also assisted in the formation of several caving clubs. On Sunday, February 26, 1984, three people entered Jacob's Well, John Wilcox, Danny Self, and Wayne Russell. Both John and Danny were scuba diving instructors who worked independently, while Wayne was an experienced caver and cave diver. The trio was carrying a full wetsuit, a single 80 cubic foot tank, a single nose regulator with an octopus, depth and pressure gauge consoles, two to three lights each, and a spare 50 cubic foot tank. Due to the narrow passages, they did not have any buoyancy compensators. They met at the first level in the first chamber, which was 25 feet deep, and then extended a safety line vertically from that point to the beginning of the third chamber, which was 55 feet deep. At a depth of about 85 feet, Wayne and John established a new safety line by running it horizontally through the third chamber and halfway into the fourth chamber. Then Wayne led the way into the fifth chamber, passing through a narrow opening while pushing his tank in front of him and laying a new safety line. Meanwhile, John took pictures while following Wayne. Danny stayed back in the fourth chamber to maintain the safety lines and to search for an old tank left by two divers who drowned in the well in 1979 and were never found. Once Wayne and John proceeded beyond the sixth chamber, Danny explored the fourth chamber, estimating it to be roughly 10 feet high by 8 feet wide. After he finished, he retrieved some spare line, removed his tank, and squeezed through the passage. Once Danny was in the fourth chamber, he located the tank, attached a piece of line to it, and began to follow the safety line out. However, he was surprised to find that the fifth chamber was incredibly narrow, measuring only about two feet in height. Furthermore, the visibility was deteriorating rapidly, causing Danny to feel increasingly anxious. 
Halfway out, he became entangled in the line he had tied to the old tank and was unable to proceed any further. After taking a deep breath, he managed to untangle himself and return to the fourth chamber. He then put his tank back on and attempted to pull the old tank through the opening. Meanwhile, Wayne had tied his safety line halfway into the fifth chamber and had attached a survey tape, a 100-foot tape measure that he would use to measure the length and diameter of the lower chambers. Wayne then ventured into the sixth chamber and beyond. John followed Wayne's safety line and survey tape into the sixth chamber, where he took pictures. Due to poor visibility, John had difficulty taking pictures and seeing clearly. Nevertheless, he got the impression that the sixth chamber was quite spacious and had a muddy bottom, unlike the rocky bottom of the other chambers. Wayne signaled to John that it was time to leave, so John followed the safety line back. However, when he reached the opening, he found that the old tank was stuck. After dislodging it, he pushed it while Danny pulled it through the opening. Then Danny exited the fourth chamber with the old tank while John exited the fifth, followed by Wayne. Later, in the third chamber, Danny and John met up. In the upper chamber, the visibility was slightly better compared to the lower chamber. Danny asked John about Wayne's whereabouts, and John indicated down the tunnel, assuming that Wayne was either setting up his survey tape or fixing his tank. Until then, there was no indication of any problem so they decided to ascend to a shallower depth to start decompressing, assuming Wayne would catch up. However, midway through their decompression stop, they started to get concerned. They couldn't go back because they were low on air and had no bottom time. Eventually, they surfaced. The next day, a dive team from Wimberley found Wayne lying on his safety line, with his mask on and his tank by his side, at the beginning of the fifth chamber. After Wayne's death, his parents discovered a poem that he had written, which was read at his funeral. On February 29, 1984, this friend of the earth and caving was buried near Utopia, Texas. In 2015, when he was just 21 years old, Diego Adami decided to attempt a free dive into Jacob's Well, a cave in Texas. Diego Adami is a highly accomplished freediver from Mexico. He was born in Mexico City and grew up near the ocean, where he developed a love for water sports. He began his freediving journey in 2010 and quickly became one of the most successful freedivers in Mexico. Adami has achieved many impressive feats in the sport of freediving. He has set several national records in various disciplines of the sport, including constant weight, free immersion, and variable weight. In 2014, he set a national record in the constant weight discipline by diving to a depth of 101 meters in the Bahamas. This adventurous young man captured the entire experience of his free dive in Jacob's Well on camera. The footage shows Diego diving into Jacob's Well without any supplementary air. He descends to the bottom of the first aperture, which is about 100 feet beneath the surface. However, during the dive, one of Diego's flippers becomes detached from his foot and he faces a significant challenge swimming back up to the surface without it. To add to the gravity of the situation, many divers have passed out in the past while attempting to resurface without a flipper. Despite these dangerous circumstances, Diego remained calm and quickly turned around in response to the incident. The situation worsened when while pushing against the narrow walls of the cave, he accidentally dropped his flashlight. This incident left him feeling vulnerable and scared, and he subsequently remembered that for a short second, he thought about death and the possibility of dying that day. However, he was fortunate enough to maintain his composure and control his breathing to avoid using up the precious and limited oxygen supply that he had. Despite the danger and the fear, he quickly assessed the situation and came up with a plan to ensure his survival. Before he ran out of air, he decided to cut off his supply belt to reduce the excess weight, and he made his way back to the surface as quickly as possible. Despite the close call and the traumatic experience he had just been through, 
Diego's passion and excitement for perilous dives remained strong and steadfast. He expressed that he had no plans to stop freediving anytime soon, and even declared that he would be back in Jacob's well for more diving adventures later in the summer. It was evident that his love for the thrill of the dive overpowered his fear of danger, and he was willing to take risks to satisfy his adventurous spirit. To tell the truth, this cave has proven dangerous on many accounts, and one will agree that only experienced cave divers should dive there. This is the exact reason why the Jacobs Well Exploration Project was established. The authorities figured it was best to carry out the work of exploration through this group of professionals and therefore curb the casualties that occurred in the cave. This is because at least nine people, one woman and eight men, lost their lives while attempting to explore the cave system at Jacobs Well. As the underwater caves at Jacobs Well pose a significant threat, the only organization authorized to explore them is the Jacobs Well Exploration Project. The Hayes County Parks Department has granted the JWEP permission to conduct diving operations at Jacobs Well. In addition to mapping and exploration, the project conducts independent research and collaborates with various groups actively studying the site. Starting in the early 2000s, the JWEP began surveying the cave and has since mapped all accessible passageways, totaling 6,000 feet. Trained cave divers began exploring Jacob's Well underwater in 2000 as part of a research project with the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association. Members of the San Marcos Area Rescue Team, or SMART, were involved in mapping and obtaining video imagery of the cave system, but these efforts were abandoned by 2002. At this point, Jimmy Price, formerly of SMART, and Jeff Chance took it upon themselves to initiate an independent exploration effort. They spent months clearing large amounts of rock and gravel that had accumulated on the gravel slope, leading to the first major restriction, which allowed them to regain access to the interior of the cave. Upon re-entering the cave, these divers discovered that it did not end at the previously reported point, and that it continued for several hundred feet into the karstic limestone. The first stage of the survey work produced a partial map of A Tunnel's deep section and a large portion of B Tunnel. This map was presented to David Baker, the landowner of the property and executive director of the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association, to aid in preserving the unique resource. As dives became more complex, more people joined the efforts. In 2004, Ryan and Andrea Eastman, as well as Rhett and Brooke Carson, became involved and played a crucial role in further extending the exploration of both A and B tunnels. The following year, longer multi-hour dives necessitated additional support. Ward Beecher and Chuck No joined in at this point, and with their help, the exploration and initial survey of the system was completed. In 2007, many members of the Good Enough Springs Exploration Project were recruited to join them, and together they became the Jacobs Well Exploration Project. This group of volunteers, self-funded cave divers, have continued to explore and conduct research activities. So far, they have mapped and surveyed all currently accessible areas of the cave system, and recorded around 6,000 feet of passages in the two primary conduits. Valuable information obtained from their surveying dives has enabled the project to create a highly detailed map of the entire cave system, which has been shared with various entities involved in aquifer protection efforts. The project survey results reveal Jacob's Well to be the longest cave in Hayes County, and at the same time, it is the second longest totally submerged known cave in Texas. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.